All right, let's continue on with example six before we move on to section four. So example six is something that you will need to be able to do on the exam. And so let's read what it says. It says at constant pressure, the combustion of 10.0 grams of ethane, C2H6, releases 517 kilojoules of heat. Write the thermochemical equation for this reaction. Okay. Um, this question is actually, in, in my opinion, it, it's very easy, it's very straightforward, but it's not as easy as you think. And we're going to talk about why that is. Ultimately, what is this asking us? It's asking us to write the thermochemical equation. Remember, a thermochemical equation is just simply the chemical equation, but it has the delta H at the very end. So even if you're sitting here and you're like, I have no idea what to do here with all these numbers and everything. Well, at the very least, hopefully you should be able to write the chemical equation since that's a review from topic nine. So let's do that first. So we have C2H6, and I know it's a gas because it tells me. All right, now C2H6 goes through combustion. What does that mean? That means it's reacting with oxygen, right? So don't forget that. Combustion is always a carbon-based compound reacting with oxygen. And also, we know that the products are always carbon dioxide gas and water. All right, so even if you didn't know anything about the thermo part, you hopefully at least could have done the chemical equation. Now, the only thing we have left to do here, and let me do it in a different color, is we do need to balance. All right, so we got two carbons here. So I'm gonna put a two here. Six carbons on that side, so I'm gonna put a three there. So that's, let's see, four, five, six, seven. So actually we need to put a two here. Ends up being a seven there. And then these would change to four and six. There we go. All right, so that's our balanced chemical equation, right? Now what we're trying to figure out to ultimately wrap up this problem is we need to figure out what is the delta H at the very end. That's what's gonna make it thermochemical. Now here's where a lot of students make a mistake. They think, oh, well, okay, it says it's releasing 517 kilojoules of energy. Cool, 517. Problem solved, done. That's not accurate, that's not true. Because remember, the delta H that goes here at the very end, this has to correspond to the mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation. So here is what I'm trying to figure out. What I need to somehow figure out is how much energy would be released if two moles of ethane were to react, right? Because, and why two? Because that's the balance, that's the coefficient right there. So I need to figure out what energy is corresponding to two moles of ethane being reacted. Okay, so how am I gonna figure that out? Well, all right, I do know that 517 kilojoules of energy are released for every 10 grams of ethane. So let's figure out, let's say, okay, well, that's the amount of energy that's released for that much ethane. Well, first of all, I don't wanna work in grams. That's not gonna help me. I wanna work in moles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out how much ethane do I have in moles? So I'm not gonna show the work for this, but I'm gonna use molar mass of ethane, C2H6. I'm gonna convert 10 grams into moles. This is just using molar mass. You should be able to know how to do this. So I'm not gonna show you the work, all right? But let's see, 10 grams divided by the molar mass of ethane. I'm gonna add that all up here. All right, I end up getting approximately, let's see, 0.3324 moles of ethane. So 10 grams of ethane is, is the same as 0.3324 moles. I, all I did was just convert it. That's all I did. So I know that 517 kilojoules of energy is released for every 0.3324 moles of ethane reacted. Well, that's great, awesome. What I'd like to know is, okay, if 517 kilojoules is released for that many moles, what is the amount of energy released for every two moles? I'm setting up an equality. Why am I choosing two moles down here? Because that's the, the mole ratio right here. I want to know what energy is released for every two moles, because if I know that, that's what goes right here at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for how much energy, and I can do that 
by you can just do cross multiplying. Okay? However you do it algebraically, you should know how to do algebra. So I'm not going to necessarily walk how to, walk through how to do that, but I am going to solve. Let's see. Okay, so five minus seventeen. I end up getting approximately, and this is my final answer, so I'm going to do sig figs. This value right here, this value here is what goes right there. So let's see, I end up getting negative 3,110 kilojoules of energy. Notice I, ha I, I kept it at negative 3,110. If you calculated with me, you'll notice, you're like, why? Well, it should have been rounded to negative uh, 3,111. The reason why is because there are three sig figs. So I had to keep this in three sig figs too. But that's this right here, this whole thing. This is my answer, okay? So it wasn't that difficult, but it wasn't as easy as you may have thought it was originally. So writing the chemical equation part should have been real easy. That's review. But to figure out this delta H, what I had to do is just come up with an equality and solve for what would be the energy for two moles since that was the mole ratio there. All right, so that's how you do example six. All right, section four. Okay, so section four is what we're getting into now, and this is gonna this is gonna take at least two videos, uh, if not three. We'll try to get done in two though. All right, the rest of this topic. Okay, the rest of the videos you're gonna see. The rest of this topic is methods for finding enthalpy. So we defined what enthalpy was, and we did a little bit of calculations with it in the last video. But how do you actually find out those values? Like for example, going back to just this this problem right here. We kind of took for granted that it just kind of tells us, oh yeah, by the way, 517 kilojoules of heat's released. Cool. All right, well, how would you find that in the lab? Like literally, if you were in the lab, how would you find that out? How would you calculate that? That's what we're gonna get to into section four. The rest of the topic, uh, section, the rest of the sections in this topic are going to be me explaining different methods for finding enthalpy. So we're gonna first start out by the, the long way or the hard way, which is experimentally doing it. If you were in the lab, how would you experimentally find out enthalpy? We'll then move on to Hess's law, standard heats of formation, and bond association energies. It's just different ways of solving for enthalpy. That's the rest of this topic. So without further ado, let's get into the first method, which is calorimetry or the experimental way of doing it. So calorimetry, excuse me, calorimetry is the measurement of heat changes within a system, right? So it's measuring how heat is changing when a certain process is taking place. Remember that when you're analyzing heat, you need to make sure that the vessel that the reaction is taking place in is an isolated system. So what we try to do, uh, a calorimeter needs to be insulated. So there's really sophisticated calorimeters, like for example, a bomb calorimeter, very, very high tech, very, um, like I said, sophisticated in how it's done. Or, you know, there's a coffee cup calorimeter. Just as good, gets the job done, okay? You, uh, you can imagine if we were to do this experiment at GCC, we'd probably use a coffee cup calorimeter. What, what is a calorimeter? What, what essentially is it? Well, obviously you have a reaction going on in here, and the coffee cups make sure it's insulated, so it makes sure no heat leaves or enters. Now there's two things that we put in there. Number one, we put a stir, because you want to make sure the reaction is being evenly distributed throughout. But then you simply put a thermometer in there and you just measure what's happening. Is it going up or is it going down? Uh, real quickly, uh, FYI, if the temperature in the thermometer were to go up, what kind of reaction or process would be taking place in here? Okay, answer to that is it's exothermic, right? Because heat is leaving the reaction and as heat leaves, the thermometer picks up that heat and that's why it goes up. But if the thermometer's temperature goes down, that means it's an endothermic reaction because the reaction taking place in here is absorbing energy. It's pulling energy from the surroundings and the thermometer senses that, senses it's getting colder. We'll cover that um, again if you didn't catch that. But that's what calorimetry is. So let's take a look at heat and temperature because a lot of times students will interchange those words and they're not the same thing. So I want you to imagine a water bottle, all right? If you were to put 100 kilojoules of energy, heat or Q, into this water bottle, okay, 100 kilojoules of energy, what do you think would happen to that temperature? Well, it would go up, right? Because, 
you know, we know that it, when something absorbs energy, its temperature is going to increase. So we see that there is some sort of relationship between heat and the change in temperature. There's a, this little symbol right here means proportional. So as uh, heat increases, so does the temperature. So does the change in temperature, right? So there's a relationship there. Okay, cool. We got that. That makes, that makes sense, right? Well, what if you had a bottle of water and then a gallon of water? And I were to put 100 kilojoules into both of these things. What would you expect to happen to their temperatures? Well, they're absorbing energy, right? So their temperature should still go up. But would the temperature increase equally? Would both of their temperatures go up equally? No. Which one do you think it would go up higher? It would be the water bottle, right? And the reason for that is because there's not as much matter to heat up. There's less water molecules. And so we see that um, there's another thing to consider. We need to consider mass. We need to consider how much is actually there. Okay, well, let's say you had an equal mass of water and an equal mass of gasoline. And you put 100 kilojoules of energy into that water, and you put 100 kilojoules of energy into that gasoline. Would you expect their temperatures to go up? Heck yeah, you would. But would you expect them to go up equally? You'd probably say no. Well, but why? We have the same mass. Why wouldn't they go up equally? Obviously, because gasoline is completely different than water, chemically speaking. So there's a third thing that differentiates how heat will affect these. And that is the third and final variable, which is S, or specific heat. So specific heat, sometimes referred to as specific heat capacity, uh, which has the letter S. What does it mean? What does it stand for? Specific heat is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Wow, that's a lot. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's look at an example. Liquid water has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. You're like, oh wow, this is gonna get pretty intense. It actually isn't, okay? Um, liquid water has a specific heat of 4.184. What does that mean? Okay, let's break it down. Let's say I had exactly one gram of water, exactly one gram, and its current temperature is 19 degrees Celsius, and I wanna increase it to 20 degrees Celsius. So I have one gram of the substance, and I wanna increase its temperature by one degree Celsius. So how much energy do I need to put into that water to do it? Well, for liquid water, it's 4.184 joules. That's what specific heat is. It's how much energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. That's what specific heat is. Let's, let's compare water to, let's say, copper. If I had one gram of copper and I wanna raise its temperature by one degree Celsius, so for example, let's say 19 to 20, how much energy do I have to put into that copper? Well, for copper, I only have to put roughly 0.39 joules, I rounded. Okay, so look, it doesn't take as much energy to increase copper's temperature as it does water. And this makes sense, right? Think about, okay, on a hot summer Arizona day, which we're fastly approaching here. Um, okay, you've got a pool of water, and then let's say you leave a piece of metal out, you know, on, on the side of the pool. Well, the water, you put your hand in the water, oh yeah, it's kind of warm, but you touch the metal and you kind of like, ah, you, like, you burn yourself, right? Why do they have different temperatures? They're both exposed to the same um, sunlight. They're both exposed to the same energy source because the metal, the copper specifically, but oh, actually all metals, metals have a very low specific heat, meaning it doesn't take them as much energy to increase their temperature. Whereas water, by comparison, water has a pretty high specific heat. So water can be exposed to the sun and it's not gonna heat up the way a metal does. So specific heat is the reasoning for that. So how do we use this equation right here? Because ultimately this creates an equation. How do we use that to do some calculations? We'll take a look at example seven in the next video.